Good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this breakfast seminar. Uh, my name is Paul Broughton. I'm the commercial uh, consul at the uh, Nor Royal Norwegian Consulate General here in Shanghai, uh, also known as Innovation Norway. I'd like to thank our Nordic colleagues and our official Chinese partners, Shanghai International Cultural Association and Jing'an District Federation for Social and Cultural Organization for allowing us to use this wonderful venue. As the video showed, we are living in an unprecedented time in history where innovation and the pace of technological change are increasing. Under the slogan innovation, which is both in part uh, which is part, uh, in part our name, company name and a buzzword for today, we can think of no other topics that are more important, more crucial, and more urgent than we will present today. Uh, exponential growth of technology, in particular artificial intelligence and the implications that this technology will have on the whole of humanity. The first speaker kicking off this morning is my colleague Ivar Musman. Please give him a warm welcome. Um, so, um, yeah, so this uh, presentation will cover uh, a range of topics, and uh, it's literally um, um, the information in this pres in my presentation I've gathered from literally hundreds of sources. Podcasts, uh, news, uh, blogs, uh, speeches, presentations, um, all kinds of things. So I've tried to cram everything together into this presentation. Uh, following me is, is, is Ben and Hugo. And I'm, I'm, again, I'm super honored that you, you, you came here today to share with us. These guys are some of the top guys, top minds in artificial, artificial intelligence today. And, uh, I've, I've, I think I've watched all the YouTube videos of these guys and they're insane. The movie we just saw, A Transcendent Man, uh, they're also featuring in this movie. So, so they're really uh, some of the top guys. So I will cover what is exponential growth technology, how to analyze and exploit it. So if you're an entrepreneur, how can you exploit uh, this rapid growth of technology? And if you're a company, how to avoid complete disaster? Uh, then we're going to look at some of these exponential technologies which are changing the face uh, of this earth. So let's start. Um, the main, the main inspiration and source of information is this book, Bold, that's by Peter Diamantes and Stephen Kotler. Um, so they, they will form the framework of this presentation. It's, it's an insane book. I read a lot about technology because I, I, I'm, I'm too fascinated, which I, I think and hope you are. And this book blew my mind several times. Uh, and what I'm presenting here is just a sliver of what's in the book. So if you like the presentation today, I urge you to pick it up. It's available in audio or, or paperback. Um, it's super cool, super cool book. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, here's the guy, uh, the, the, the clip we just saw. He's the uh, director of engineering at Google. Uh, he's one of the sort of the, the, yeah, probably the god, I would say, of artificial intelligence and the exponential growth of technology. Maybe Ben and Hugh can argue on that. He said about this book, if you read one business book in the century, it should be this book. So it's an important book. So let's go. We have a lot of stuff to cover. Uh, so a lot of stuff happens, like we saw. Uh, even 10 or 20 years ago, uh, things were a little bit different. So does anybody remember this company called Kodak? I think most, most people do. Uh, in 1996, uh, 19 years ago, they had uh, 140,000 employees. They had a market cap of 28 billion US dollars, and they had 85% market share. So they were basically the top dog number one in the camera market. Then what happened? A little company from Finland called Nokia in 1992 launched the first mobile phone, their first mobile phone. And uh, you say, so what? You know, it's, it's uh, you know, they do mobile phones. What well, that has to do with cameras? But of course, we all know the story. In 2002, 10 years later, there, there was unprecedented uh, uh, pace of technology. A lot of stuff happened in the cell phone market. In 2002, they launched the first camera phone. And what did Kodak do? 
How did they react? What did they say about this camera? It's grainy, it's shaky, you will never be able to get a proper uh, camera photo out of, out of that. Uh, people will always uh, prefer uh, you know, the paper photos. It has artistic value and blah, blah, blah. And a couple of years later, they're facing bankruptcy. And actually in 2012, they went bankrupt. They tried to modernize, they tried to go digital, but it was all uh, of little avail. So companies like Kodak, that's just one example, they're literally submerged in their own technology parad paradigm, and they cannot imagine that this big edifice that they've built will come crumbling down. They can't imagine it. So that's why they laugh, laughed about uh, Nokia. And this happens to a lot of industries. Uh, Tower Records, does anyone, anyone know this? They're a huge, or they used to be in, in America, a huge supplier. They were selling uh, vinyl records, um, cassette tapes, DVDs, CD-ROMs, etc. Uh, in 1986, they had $250 million in revenue in, uh, in the US. And in 1993, this little company called Napster, which was a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing uh, company um, where you can download for free MP3s. And how did Tower Records react? People are never going to buy MP3s because vinyl has this richness and depth of sound. And people are always going to prefer uh, quality to this crappy el electronic digital music. Well, bye-bye Tower Records. 2004, they went bankrupt. There's a huge Tower Records in Tokyo. They didn't go bankrupt. Just forget the last slide. Uh, and, you know, if you go back in more, like the young people here, uh, do you remember uh, b before you were born, there was this thing called the post office? And if you want to send people a message half across the world, you have to actually use something called a pen. You have this thing called a paper. You have to take the pen right on the paper, and you have to walk physically to this place called the post office. There you have to take a number. You have to stand in line uh, for some time. And then you have to go to this glass wall and talk to the person behind there. You have to buy something called a stamp. You have to put it on. You have to give them money. And then uh, you have to write the address on it. And hopefully, probably, it's going to make it. Let's say it's shipped to Brazil. It's going to take how long to, for, for, to mail a letter to Brazil? I don't know, a week, two weeks? And you have to pay, I don't know, five, ten RMB or something? And then you have to wait for the person to receive it. He has to read it. He has to read it again. So, obviously, we have something better. Uh, So um, things are, are moving like quickly. Uh, it's, it's insane. We can let's, let's just run through this thing. Traditional stores. And when remember when you have actually had to buy something? Last time I bought I, I bought Christmas uh, um, gift for, for Christmas. This is the first time I had a, a friend of mine, uh, a Chinese girl. I skyped to my parents. I said, "Okay, what do you want for Christmas? My brother, what do you want? What do your kids want?" Tuck, 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 tuck. She bought it. Done. It was probably half an hour. The whole Christmas shopping done. Uh, Best Buy, may maybe actually this laser pointer doesn't work on the screen. Uh, Best Buy and Media Market, uh, maybe, maybe Ben now, maybe you'll see it. There's, a, there's a Best Buy in Japan as well. But uh, I don't know if you remember, they used to be in China, I think maybe four years ago, they went bankrupt. Media Market, huge, I used to live in Germany before, they're huge. Media Market, Saturn, big companies, stores everywhere. They tried to launch a huge store in, in Hai Halu, I don't know if you remember. And I think that lasted for about a year or something, or maybe longer before they, they closed down. And soon, Amazon will deliver packages in minutes or hours with a drone. Uh, do you, does anyone remember a company called Nokia? So this, there's this small Finnish uh, uh, mobile phone maker. And uh, in 2008, you know, they, they eradicated Kodak. In 2008, they had a global market share in the smartphone market for about 40%. And then there was a small company at the edge of bankruptcy before Steve Jobs came in. I think there were like three weeks almost, they were running out of money, and when he came in, it was crazy. And then it, everyone knows the story, of course, 2007, uh, Apple launches the iPhone. And uh, how did Nokia react to the iPhone? Uh, so Ansi Vanyoki, I don't know how to pronounce this, maybe some Finnish people could correct me. He said, Apple has attracted much attention at first, but they have still remained a niche manufacturer. That will be in the mobile phones as well. Okay. In 2013, they have 3.4% market share globally. Those are the numbers I found. So let's raise a hand. How many people have a Nokia phone today? 
One guy, cool. So we're about 100 people here, so 1%. So, uh, yeah, hotels. How many people use Airbnb? Okay, cool. How many people will use Airbnb for the next holiday? Okay, okay, a few people still coming. Uh, does anyone know about this company called Blockbuster? Yeah, and in China, of course, you have you know Netflix competitors. Um, yeah, gasoline cars versus Tesla. In uh, 2008, Tesla launches the Roadster. And how did the gasoline car companies react? What did they say? Oh, no one's going to buy an electric car. It looks like a toy car. People want to hear the roar of the engine. It doesn't have enough range. It takes too long to charge. There's no charging sta station. There's no infrastructure. It's going to fall apart. It's a shit car. It'll never work. Okay. Uh, in 2012, four years later, Tesla launches the Model S. And Car of the Year, uh, Motor Trend names it Car of the Year. Car and Driver calls it Car of the Century. So let's look at some numbers. The gasoline car manufacturer said no one wants to buy Tesla. Okay. So 2013 US sales in units, the Model S, 17,000. Beating Mercedes, BMW, Audi, Lexus, Porsche. And shortly after that, uh, Tesla launched the Model S D. D is for, for dual engine, two engines, it's all wheel drive. It goes 0 to 100 kilometers an hour, 2.8 seconds, and it has longer range. Uh, I think uh, three months ago or something, they launched the Model X, which is an SUV, which has even more crazy technology. Um, and then in 2017, they plan if they can build a Gigafactory. By the way, have you heard about the Gigafactory? It's, uh, it's a joint venture between Tesla and Panasonic and they're going to build, build it in Texas because they need this gigafactory. It's a huge factory producing batteries. And the, this factory, when it's operational, it's 100% uh, driven by solar power. And this, this one factory alone will create uh, as much battery as the rest of all existing companies producing batteries. One factory. This model is called the Model E. And... Uh, you see it, right? Right. Okay. Cool. Thought I was gonna get a reaction to that. <laughs> they called it a Model E, and uh, they wanted to call it the Model E, but then this, I think it was the CEO of Ford. He calls up and says, "Well, you cannot call it Model E because we have a Model E, so we have a patent on it. You're not allowed to use Model E." So Elon, he says, "Okay, whatever. Uh, we call the guy up. Why? Are you serious? Are you really gonna use Model E? Are you gonna produce a car called Model E?" And the guy says, "Yeah, yeah, we are. Yeah, we are. Okay, great." So that's the old industry versus the new one. Tesla gives out free patents of most of their technology. The, ch the supercharging stations, they give them out. They say, hey, we're, we're going to make money, of course, we have to survive. But we want, our mission is to make, to go from a, a, um, oil energy, dependent energy, to, to a solar energy. So let's all make electric cars so you can use all our patents. Versus, versus Ford and we keep on E. So Tesla solved it by calling it um, the Model 3. You know, people love Tesla. Uh, so let's stick to cars, taxis. How many people use Uber or Lyft? Yeah. How many people prefer Uber to taxis? Yeah, it's just far better, you know. Um, sticking to cars still. Drivers, Google, self-driving cars. You know, things are changing like crazy. And some people say, well, yeah, it's still some years away. It doesn't take so long. A few weeks ago, just from my Twitter, Tesla updated the software on all existing Model S's. So now it can drive itself for free. Yeah? So you get an upgrade in the car, and now it can drive itself. You don't have to go to the, the auto shop to fix something. You don't have to, to install extra equipment. No, it's already there. The same thing with the supercharger network. In the beginning, it didn't exist. But they built it into the car, so they built the infrastructure of the superchargers. They can use it. And the funny thing is, in the beginning, people complained there was a lot of problems with the Tesla. The windshield wipers didn't work properly. And uh, so what they did, they just tweaked the software, sent the upgrade over the air. And the next day, people wake up, the windshield wipers work. So they have the feeling that like, almost like three uh, invisible elves are fixing their car. You know, It's incredible. It's basically it's software. 
So that's uh, self-driving cars. Let's go a little bit back and look at electricity. When Tesla and Edison popularized electricity, uh, they went to war with each other because Tesla was uh, doing alternate current and Edison was doing the direct current, and they had a fight. And actually, they went so far as to electrocute an elephant using, uh, I think, DC power. And in the 1881 electricity exhibition in Paris, the media said uh, that when this exhibition is, is packed down, this will be the last time consumers will see electricity. Uh, because then the, the world will return to the reliable source of, of heat and energy of paraffin. So that's how they, they reacted. And then, then they proceeded to print news article after news article of, of houses burning down. They said only the, only the elitist rich people would possibly want to uh, take ele electric wires, rip down the walls, put in the wires of the sole purpose of burning your house down. Yeah? So they didn't say Tesla, Edison, this is amazing. Thank you so much for this amazing invention to, to humankind. You're going uh, uh, to increase the lifespan. People are going to change the whole manufacturing system. People are going to live longer. You're going to eradicate poverty. No, they said, you crazy cook, you're going to burn our houses down. That's how they reacted. Let's go back even further. Look at the horse and carriage industry. You know, when the first automobile came, how did they react? They said, oh, who's going to want to buy a gasoline car? They're, they're smelly, they're expensive, they're noisy, uh, they destroy the roads, there are no proper roads. Uh, just crazy people w w would buy this car. Um, yeah, so... That's the horse and carriage. So you see, you see the line through history, industry after industry. Even Nokia we made the worst example. You know they repeat these mistakes. So let's look a little closer at the Kodak story. It was started by George Eastman. He was obsessed with chemistry. He worked in his mother's basement. 1880 was the camera. 1888 it was commercially available. As you press the button, we do the rest. And uh, George Eastman's uh, goal was to make photography as easy, as convenient as a pencil. In 1892, Kodak Eastman Company was born, and the next 100 years, he, he, ju he did just that. He worked to make photography as easy as a pencil. In 1975, there was, uh, there was a graduate student called Steven Sassan. He was hired by Kodak, and he was asked, he was given one task. Is it possible to store images digitally? So he worked with this, and he made the first digital camera. It was 3.8 kilos. A resolution of 0 0.01 megapixel. It stored 30 black and white images, uh, and they stored it on cassette tape. So no film, no paper. And what questions uh, did the management team ask uh, Steven Sasson? How did you do this? This is amazing. This is the greatest technology ever made. Oh my God, we're going to revolutionize everything. No, they said, when's it ready? When can we use it? When will it pose a threat to us? When will other people catch up? And why would anybody want to use it? So basically, they ignored it. Yeah. So that's the reaction. Uh, and actually, the one, when, let's go back. When they asked Steven Sasson, uh, when will this technology be ready? He said 15 years. So he predicted 1990. How did he do that? He used something called Moore's Law, um, which says, Gordon Moore, I'm sure you probably know it if you're interested in this type of thing, so I'm not going to spend too much time. Basically, it says the number of components on, in, on a dense in integrated circle doubles uh, every 12 to 18 months. That means if you have uh, a motherboard with 100 components this year, next year it's going to be 200 components, and then it's going to be 400. So it goes from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8, 16, 32, etc. It follows exponential growth as opposed to linear growth, uh, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So why is this important? And let's, let's look at a linear versus exponential. So if you take six linear steps, you know, one, two, three, I get to six. If you do it exponentially, one, two, uh, four, eight, uh, 16, you get to 32, okay? No big difference, you know, they look the same. Uh, okay, it's a little bit different, 256 up to step nine, and then it explodes. After 11 steps, you hit, you hit 1,000. That's a hundredfold increase. So let's. So the, that scale was up to a thousand. Let's increase the scale. Let's go for a billion. That was the the the, the last chart ended at a thousand. That's it. You can't see the difference. Next one, four million. Still can see it. That one happens. It just explodes. Hits a billion. 
So said in a different way, if you take 30 linear steps, uh, if, I, if I walk 30 steps over here, it's 30 steps. So I get maybe you know, a third cross across this exhibition. If I take 30 exponential stops, steps, I do a billion steps. Now, now, it's, now it's a challenge. How, if, I, if I walk from here, a billion steps, how far, how far do I get? Let's say I, I go out of Shanghai, I walk west, I walk a billion steps or a billion meters. How far is that? Anyone? Does anyone dare? <laughs> to, to the moon? To, 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 to uh, or where? Like what? Norway? How far do we get? Or just make up your own idea. How far do we get? To another planet. To another planet. Sh shouldn't that smart people? 26 times around the Earth. You go 26 times around the Earth, and that's the point. We'll get to it later, but like Kodak, they're thinking, okay, it's going to go one, two, three, four. Okay, so it's the mega. It started 0 0.01 megapixel. Okay, 0 0.01, and then a 0 0.02, 0 0.04. Okay, 0. Po who cares? No, it's it's never going to catch up. This is shit. 26 times around the Earth. Let's imagine that a little bit more. That's if you take the Earth, stretch it out and you place it 26 times versus 30 steps. I mean, that's insane. And that's the type of thinking that you know, people can't possibly imagine. That's why it's so difficult to, to understand exponential growth. And, and, and underestimating ex exponential growth is very easy to do. So we humans, we evolved over hundreds of thousands of years as hominoids. And how was our life? Our life was local and linear. It means uh, local, everything in our life was basically a day or a few days walk away. And over tens or hundreds of years, nothing really changed. If you're running after a gazelle, you run linearly. Uh, he's running there, you run there. It's a straight line, right? So our, our brains are hardwired biologically to think linearly. We don't understand exponentials. Today, however, we're living in a global and exponential world. So, if something happens across the world, you know about it instantly. And things, a lot of things doesn't happen in a thousand years, a lot of things happen in six months. And our brains are not evolved to understand this. However, if the goal is to avoid these kinds of mistakes, if you're Kodak or a company, or, and if you want to exploit it, if you're an entrepreneur, then you better understand the characteristics of exponential growth. Because that puts you in a very good um, position as a company. If you understand this, you can take advantage. If you don't understand it, probably your company is going to go out of business. Because we live in a world where exponential growth is a new par paradigm. So you better understand it. Um, Peter Diamandis and Stephen Kotler, uh, which wrote the, uh, wrote the book Bold, they developed a framework for understanding uh, this exponential growth. With this framework, you can analyze, it, you can look at the ex industries today and understand which, where they're going to go, which industries that you probably should uh, you know, position yourself in. Maybe you should learn something about this. So what are the 60s? Digitization, deception, disruption, demonetization, dematerialization, and democratization. 60s. We'll go through them very quickly. Let's start with digitization. And let's take the code exa example. So what happened to Kodak? Kodak was in the memory business. And the memory business used to be physical. It was physical image uh, pros uh, on film, developed on film, and it was stored on a piece of paper. And then suddenly, it became digital, right? It went from physical stuff to uh, an image processed with ones and zeros and stored as ones and zeros. So that's what happened to Kodak. You know, if you look again at the linear curve, Kodak was, uh, it was, it was on, this, on this path, right? Not so much happened in, in the development of the technology of the film. Yeah, something happened, not really so fast. It was evolving linearly. And then Nokia, uh, actually w when the, um, Sasson invented the camera, the whole industry jumped from the red one, it jumped to the blue one. But Kodak didn't, ima they didn't understand. You know, they, th they thought I was going to, well, it, in, the, in, the, in the past it evolved like this, it's going to do it in the future. No. So that's what happened. So the whole industry moved and they didn't even know it. Um, right, so after uh, digitization, we have deception. What is deception? 
Deception means it went from 0.01 .01 megapixel to 0.02 to 0.04. It's deceiving because it doesn't seem like it's a big deal, right? 0.02 is nothing. So it's initially deceptive, but then it becomes visually disruptive. And that's the next D, disruption. So disruption, we define as any innovation that creates uh, a new market and it disrupts an existing one. So we look at the Kodak again. We see the, the evolution of the technology following the linear curve, more or less, and then suddenly the digital camera is invented. Actually, it starts before that with the invention of computers and stuff like this. And then it takes on exponential growth. And if you're a company, you better understand this and you better be on the blue line. And so we live, in, we live in an exponential era where it's disrupt or be disrupted. Right. Um, so to sum up, we have digitization, then follows deception, then follows disruption. And how do they react? How does every, like we saw in the beginning, all these slides, all these industries, what do they do? First they ignore it, then they laugh, then they understand, oh shit, something's happening. They start fighting it, and then they lose. Every time. Well, not every time, but often. <laughs> uh, right, so now we have the three Ds left. We'll go through them quickly. Demonetization, what does that mean? Mm. Demonetization is the vanishing of money from, from the process, the vanishing of money from goods and services. So let's say, uh, yeah, who needs film? Well, you have megapixels, right? Film, uh, and uh, it just disappeared. So let's take one example. Let's say you're sitting in Shanghai in Wagas Cafe, uh, or uh, actually since EQ is our food provider, let's say you're sitting in EQ Cafe, if they even have cafes. Uh, you're using a computer, and you're running a free version of Linux. You're using free Google Docs. You're using the free internet, and you're using free Skype, and you're using a free version of Google Chrome. It's all free. H yet, Linux is a $30 billion uh, ecosystem. Google is one of the most valuable and, and profitable companies in history. And Skype, in 2008, I think it was 2008, was sold for $8.5 billion to Microsoft. Yet, they're giving you everything for free. How is it possible? And the coffees are selling for $5. Yeah, and they're queuing up. You can barely get a cup of coffee. So uh, then we come to the next D, which is dematerialization, which is literally vanishing of the goods and services completely. So we have the film. Who needs film when you have megapixels? Who needs a camera when you have a smartphone? And who needs actually pictures when you have megapixels? You know, one there, one there, they're there. Very profitable, gener generating a lot of money for you. And the next day, they're gone. Poof. So let's just, like, you know, we all use for smartphones every day. We don't really think so much about it. But just if you stop and think, the 1980s luxury technology, which is packed in the cell phone, just imagine. How, how many goods and services did the iPhone or whatever other phone uh, dematerialize? The phone, radio, camera. Uh, and these are just some of the apps I could find. Uh, your pictures. Maps, remember you used to drive around, you know, probably when you were younger you were driving with your family around Europe on road trips and you had one guy assigned to being the map guy to read. <laughs> and then uh, we went through the letters, uh, health records, I mean it's still in existence, yeah. Apple now launched obviously the new health app. Pedometer, I never actually used it but it's there. Pigeons, uh, the weather guy. Uh, I don't, Safari, I mean, I didn't even know what kind of icon. It represent, represents the world's information. And then, uh, yeah, this other stuff, books. I mean, I'm sure you can think of things. Reporter's handbook, books, voice recorder, video game arcade, flashlight, TV, clock, it's getting boring, record collection, tape recorder, dictionary, encyclopedia, daily newspaper, video conferencing system, pocket foreign language, Translation, scanner, payment terminal, Friends. GPS device, friends, sorry, I forgot that one. <laughs> Girlfriends, no, that was a bit high. The news, the iPod, 
paper comics, calculator, calendar. I mean, I mean, and that's probably one percent. I mean, you know, what I mean? you don't think about it. I made the list, and I just really blew my mind. Everything is in the in the pocket. It's insane, and that's all because of the power of exponentials. Uh, next, the last D is democratization, which is basically uh, the hard cost of a goods and service drops to the point where you can upload it on the platform. It's free, available to everyone. So the example is in the 1990s. Actually, a, a Maasai, uh, what do you call it, Maasai warrior, for example, a poor person somewhere else has mo has access to more information than Bill Clinton had in the 1990s. That's democratization. Power to the people. Uh, yeah. So th th these are all examples from the from the past. Let's have a look at the future. These are some interesting statistics. So. Uh, 1920s, the average age of a company on the S&P 500, 67 years. 2010, 15 years. In 2020, oh by the way, this is uh, research done, of, uh, done over 10 years by uh, Professor Richard Foster. Uh, in 2020, <laughs> more than 75% of the uh, companies on the S&P 500 we haven't even heard about. Interesting. 2025. 40% of the top companies <laughs> will no longer exist. Yeah, 40%. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, that's 10 years away. Uh, so, the lesson is for linear thinking companies, the linear thinking of the 1960s will be your downfall. Simple. So, let's uh, wrap up the story of Kodak uh, and by looking at Instagram. Uh, 2007, Kodak went out of business. In 2010, Instagram was, was founded, and they continued on George Eastman's uh, mission of making photography as convenient as a pencil. In February 2012, they were valued, valued at $25 million, so two years after they were, they were founded. Uh, a couple months later, they launched the Android app for Instagram. It was, mil it was one, one million dollars in one day. Uh, and it, the value shot up to half a billion. Then, Facebook bought Instagram <laughs> and its 13 employees for, uh, for one billion. Uh, so that's in the same month. And ironically enough, uh, the same year, Kodak went out of business. Right? Uh, September. Yeah. This year, Instagram celebrated 400 million users. So. So how did Kodak, which is a 100-year-old company, uh, had 140,000 employees in 1996, 19 years ago, and this huge market cap go bankrupt? And how did a handful of entrepreneurs, 13 people, go from working in the garage to a billion-dollar buyout in 18 months? Simple. Instagram was an exponential organization, and Kodak was a linear organization, as we saw. So, welcome to the new Kodak moment. This is the time when, when an exponential force puts a linear business or industry out of business. So, small everyone. <laughs> so, that was the past. Now we're going to look at, uh, so now we established that we have this thing called expansion growth technology. It's super powerful. Companies that, are, that, are, that are understand this growth, this, um, this evolution, and are able to take advantage of this. We call them uh, exponential companies. So let's look at some of the exponential industries and what they're doing. Uh, so due to time, I don't have so much time, so we, I'm going to look at 3D printing and Bitcoin. And my two other distinguished speakers are going to focus on arguably the most important one by long shot, robotics and artificial intelligence. So let's start with 3D printing. How many people have 3D printed before? Do you, do you have, have you tried it before? Obviously these guys. It's one guy. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So, what is 3D printing? Uh, 3D printing is uh, additive manufacturing as opposed to sub subtractive manufacturing. Sub subtra subtractive manufacturing is, uh, the first example is uh, stone chipping. So you have two rocks, you, you chip them against each other until all that's left is a really sharp rock and you put it at the end of a wooden stick and I have a spear. I can kill pigs. 
uh, as Michelangelo famously said, uh, you know, he would chip away until he set, until all that was left was David. David. So he said, I saw the angel in the marble and I carved until I set him free. So that's subtractive manufacturing. Um, 3D printing is additive manufacturing. So instead of taking stuff, why well, you add them? Yeah. So basically, it's like imagine you have your own printer, desktop printer in, in your office or home that, that gets instructions from the computer in two dimensions, x, y, right? So it prints it. 3D printing is just adding a third dimension, the z-ax. So it just, it just gets instructions, does one layer, gets another instruction, adds a layer, and it does it, and then in the end, you have this. So it's just a third dimension to, to, to printing. Charles Hull invented the, the 3D printing in, in the 1980s, and he founded something called uh, 3D Systems. Uh, that was the first 3D printing company in 84. Uh, it took about 20 years. Development was slow, ex expensive, super complicated. Uh, and this is actually the first 3D printer. You know, you can kind of, you know, think back to the first uh, digital camera. And that was um, after, I think, 16 years of development. It looked like that. So 16 years of hard development, you go from this to that. And that was in the early 2000s. And 3D Systems was at the verge of bankruptcy. They had six printers. They could print four materials, and they had to source the material from somewhere else. The cost of a printer was about 200,000 US dollars. And it was, you, have to, you have to literally have to be an astronaut to use it, because it was super complicated. Uh, today, 3D Systems is a $6 billion company. And they have 40 printers. And uh, they print whole dashboards with this printer. They have 100 different materials. They make most of the materials themselves. And they have all sorts of different materials, from nylon, plastic, uh, even biological, and cells, and to sol solid metal. So that's, you see, the development. The, the, the cheapest one, the smallest one, is called Cube. Today, it's, it retails for $1,300. But in a couple of years, it's going to be $500, making it very attractive. So the goal is to make a 3D printer so easy that kids can use it. You can use a mouse, you can use a 3D printer. And you can even design for one. So today, we're standing at the cliff of the 3D printing revolution. So let's have a look. Let's have a look at what we have today, just some examples. Um, you know, this is just not even 1%. iPhone uh, uh, cases, a vase, uh, another crazy thing, decorative thing, things that are basically impossible to make in normal ways. I have an example here. I got it from like a visit to incubator, very simple. Who wants it? I'll throw it. No, I'm just too close. You, this one? Okay. What, this one? Okay, I'll take the guy. Cool. So that's actually, just pass it around. And uh, whenever you feel you're done, please don't stick it in your pocket. Throw it back to the stage. And let's see if I can catch it. Um, please don't throw out the screen. Um, yeah, so actually it's kind of cool because it, it has like, uh, what do you call those Russian things where you have the dolls? One after one after one. Babushka. So it's kind of like a matryoshka. matryoshka. Cool. Babushka's ah. <laughs> <laughs> and you, uh, yeah, I, I didn't want to give it away, but I'll, I'll do it now because you entered. And you know what? I can tell you. I'm not going to even look it up because some know this guy is, has, is right. Do you know why I'm right? Uh, it's, okay, I'll say it. You know, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. I just heard it yesterday. Uh, ben Gertzel has an IQ, is, can I say it? Is that a cool? Yeah, it's cool, right? Yeah, I'll say it. This is Porter. Has an IQ higher than 180. Okay? So I'll trust him. In the world today, I looked it up yesterday. It was Yahoo Answers. So I'm not sure how reliable this is. But apparently, according to this Yahoo Answers, in the world today, there's about 356 people with 100 IQ, uh, 180 IQ or higher. Okay? So the speaker after me is one of the smartest people in the world. Not to not to build you up, Ben. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but I have to say it. I think it was so cool. It blew my mind. Anyway, so please, please pass it around. It's a, it's a marushka, babushka. It's a thing that so it basically it has six layers, or I think it's six or five. So you have like one ball and then another ball and another ball. It's a super simple thing, but it's kind of cool. So have a look at it. 
That's, I think it's called, called like a gyro cube, which basically the inside spins, the outside doesn't. You know, you can make things, oh, this is all the women, take notice, sit up and take notice. These are 3D printed shoes. And actually, uh, it's kind of difficult to admit, but I actually really like Project Runway. You know the show, Project Runway? Yeah, it's I I've seen all the seasons. <laughs> uh, it's really true. <laughs> and uh, I think this time, I keep asking in the DVD store, hey, do you have the new season? Game of Thrones, Project Runway. Uh, I think this season they're going to do 3D printed stuff. I saw it like a teaser or something. It was really cool. So, so just imagine that thing alone. It's going to turn all women across the world. Despite age, despite culture, despite where we are, they're all going to look like this. <laughs> yeah? Sorry to typecast here, but, you yeah. know. Or you can ha even have whole stores. And you probably have the same thing for guys, too, you know, uh, on the things they like. I don't know, pool, pool cues. Um, sh more shoes. Uh, these are from uh, New Balance. Adidas as well are experimented 3D printing. Nike. Uh, you can go into a store, print shoes, leave. You know, so who who wants you know the the 39 size? You get your own size, whole bodies, whole dresses for that matter. I mean, how cool is that? You can do stuff you haven't even seen before. It's impossible to do with using people. It's cheaper. It looks cool. It looks. I mean, you can and you can. There's no you know, the imagination. There's no limits. You can do whatever you want and you can do it yourself. I mean, yeah. So that's the fashion part. This is the the health part. Yeah, Paul. Um, he actually was sort of limping, he has crutches. So, uh, but if you think that's cool, wait two pictures, something cooler. So it doesn't only have fashion, it has actually help, help benefits, it can help people, you know, with built-in functions. You know, I mean, this is life-changing, you know? This, this, this changes the kid's life. I mean, look at them. You know, they can pick up the ball. I think this is football. <laughs> <laughs> Currently, so you, you this is called exoskeleton. You know, you strap, you go, you jump into it, and you can walk around. It makes you stronger. It basically makes you like Iron Man. I mean, not this one, because it's probably expensive, looks kind of silly. But in a couple of years, you know, you know the Iron Man thing. You have the full robot. Yeah, that's a liver, 3D printed liver. You know, just imagine alone in the medical market, you can print organs. You know, you don't have to have a card around your neck saying if you, you're in a car accident and you, you fucking die, you can, you, you can take your liver out. You, you just make them. The same with animals. We can, instead of killing all animals in, in these, you know, terrible places, you can, you can, you can print food. You know, it's going to change everything. And you can destroy too. You know, we're putting, we're putting um, technology and power into the hands of people that was previously only for, for governments, countries, you know. So it poses a lot of challenges to humankind. We have to, you know, seriously discuss a lot of things. Small wheels to haul cars, yeah, uh, or houses, castles. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's how, sort of how they make them. You just do like this, make a wall. In China, I think they're really advanced for this. Uh, yeah, and the retail guys are getting into it too. You go to Amazon, eBay, you, you go to the 3D store. You know, it's super cool. It changes everything. Uh, and also, it's interesting, as you know, this other uh, slide, it was the, the, it's getting down to $500 now for a 3D printer, right? So it's getting to be an attractive investment. So instead of buying this iPhone case, I mean, here you can buy an iPhone case for 10 RMB, but if you go to the US or Norway, it's probably going to pay 150 RMB. So maybe you should buy a 3D printer, print some iPhone cases, you know? Print enough, yeah, it pays for itself, you know? Uh, or this thing called Thingiverse, it's super cool. It's like the App Store or the Android Store. Or so, okay, so, so the 3D printer, obviously you send them instructions to print stuff. So it's just like a cut design, you know? I think it's people out here, they know more. Actually, we have Nitin. Is it I'm so I wanted to say this in the beginning, I forgot. I mean, we have so many nice people here. We have the CEO from Norway of a company. We're super honored to have you here. We have the boss from Beijing. You have Nitin. He's my first flatmate in Shanghai. Uh, he runs uh, Green Drinks Initiative and Green Drinks, which is like a huge community for architects and designers in Shanghai. They have meetups, I think, once a week or something. Super cool. And uh, War 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 Warwick, he, he, he's, uh, he's a TEDx TED speaker. Uh, he wrote uh, the One Minute Presenter. And so we have friends, colleagues, I'm, I'm happy. Anyway, I forgot to say that. 
But um, so Thingiverse, you can basically you just download for free instructions to your 3D printer, and you just print stuff, right? So instead of the App Store, where people make apps, throw, throw them on the App Store, you can, you can download for free, and they can download free you know, designs for 3D printers. Oh, you, oh, this is, oh, yeah, oh, this has some really cool shoes. You put on the Thingiverse, other people can, can make them for almost nothing. So uh, 3D printing has been popularized and called um, the third industrial revolution. The steam engine was the start of it. And then Henry Ford uh, used ec economies of scale and the mass productions, which means basically if you produce enough, it's going to get cheap. 3D printing will democratize manufacturing. So it's going to take manufacturing away from big corporations, big companies. It previously, you have to buy a factory, you have to have specialized labor, you have to have a specialized machine. Now everyone can do it. Uh, let's go to some more advanced examples. This is SpaceX. We talked about Tesla before. I'm sure a lot, most people know that's the second company of uh, this amazing <laughs> Elon Musk. <laughs> you know, I mean, he does SpaceX, Tesla. Uh, he's a chairman of Solar City. He's doing Hyperloops. It's insane. Um, and it, he's calling his lineup of cars things like Sex. You know, that's cool. It's like the new, new cool entrepreneurs. So SpaceX, they actually have um, they their uh, their headquarters in California. They actually produce. So SpaceX is, is a, it's it's a private comp uh, it's a privately owned uh, space company. So they want to fly stuff into space. And Elon Musk is the CEO. So they have in California they do they do produce. And there's only like I don't know may maybe a handful of other competitors. There are not a lot of people that that are doing space. <laughs> you know, it's very expensive. The f the probability of failing is really high. So a lot a lot of people don't do it. Don't do it. And most of the rocket companies, they outsource from thousands of, of, manuf of suppliers. SpaceX makes most of it themselves in California. So, and they do cool stuff like Oculus Rift. You know the Oculus Rift? This is 3D virtual reality uh, thing you put on, and suddenly you're transparent into the digital world. They combine Oculus Rift, Leap Motion, which basically detects your, 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 your motion. So now you can see you're li living in computer land. It can detect your hands, everything. And then you combine a three metal 3D printer, and you can design stuff in the air, and you can just send it to the 3D printer. So that's sort of Iron Man type, type capabilities, which, ironically enough, Iron Man was actually sort of based a little bit on Elon Musk. Before they did the movie, they wanted to find like a crazy character, Robert Downey Jr., and he was following Elon Musk around because Elon Musk was the sort of the, the closest example of Iron Man today. Um, yeah, and this is the Dragon 2 capsule. Uh, engine. This is the new generation of spacecrafts, which is are being designed by, by SpaceX now. Um, they're designed to take seven astro astronauts into space, and they're going to dock with the International Space Station. It's designed to go to other planets and land by itself, and then it's designed to go back into orbit, in, into uh, break through the orb uh, orbit of the Earth, and then land by itself with four rockets. So it stops like this. And that's revolutionary in, uh, in, uh, in space and rocketry. Because today, the th way things are done, you take, you take a rocket, you send it up to the International Space Station, and when it goes, goes back, it plunges into the ocean, and you fish out the people. You know, imagine you fly from Shanghai to London, <coughs> and you crash land in the ocean, and you put on a life vest, and they fish you out. And the airplane is just left to rot at the bottom uh, of the Atlantic. That's how spacecraft works today. But uh, SpaceX is changing everything. They're going to have rockets that go to space, re-enter, sits down, refuels, and flies up again. And currently, there's something like um, half the cost, I think, of the competitors. And once they do, are managed to, to successfully uh, use this technology, they got probably like a tenth of the cost or something, which really will enable uh, or privatize uh, going into space. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, yeah, other example, Boeing, they 3D print most of um, like 200 parts for 10 different airplane uh, platforms. Uh, there's something called CFM uh, International. They build engines for airplanes. Then in 2016, they're going to make an engine which has this revolutionary new nozzle which enables 15% fuel savings in an aircraft. Imagine over the 
lifetime span on the, of an airplane, 15% reduction cost. That's translated into hundreds of billions of dollars because of 3D printers, because they print stuff you cannot print before. <coughs> Sorry about that. So um, every aspect of the industry, which is $10 trillion, is going to be changed. And that means $10 trillion of opportunity for exponential engineers that understand this. Let's look at uh, one example. This is the International Space Station. It's at the back end of the most advanced, most complicated, most expensive supply chain in history. It, uh, to send one kilo into space, to ship it to the International Space Station for resupply, it costs uh, 140,000 RMB, one kilo. And part of the problem is that you have to, it, ha it has to uh, withstand gravity, you know, and it has, so it has to be more heavy. <coughs> uh, Made in Space is a new company. They're trying to change all this. So imagine, uh, yeah, so they can, they print stuff in space. So you can, if you print in space, you have no gravity, which means you can make structures that are impossible to make on Earth. You can have structures that cannot uh, hold its own weight, for example. You can do research experiments in space, <coughs> a lot of cool stuff. Um, yeah, we don't have so much time I hear. I get whispered, so let's just pile through here. Uh, their dream is to basically colonize space. <coughs> because the dream is to you, you send the 3D printer into space, and then you get the materials from asteroids. So you mine, so you go to, say, Mars, you bring a 3D printer, you just mine the stuff from there, and you build stuff from there, so you don't have to ship it from the Earth. Uh, uh, ben, how much time do I have? <coughs> I'm out. I have zero. Yeah, yeah, Shit. Like this, Can Seriously? That's insane. Uh, sorry about that. I'm sorry. Can I do Bitcoin really fast? Because that's the one I'm most passionate about. Really. Uh, although artificial intelligence is, more, uh, is a lot more, ex a lot more um, important. So how many people have ever heard about Bitcoin? Oh, cool. How many people own Bitcoin? Okay, if you... <coughs> by, by the way, I'm going to take basically all of the, the information, well, not all of it. We're going to use Andreas Antonopoulos, who wrote the, the book Mastering Bitcoin. It's 300 pages long, and as he, sell, he, as he said himself, at the time of publishing, it was outdated, and he has to update it every three months to keep up with what is Bitcoin. I also want to thank Trace Mayer, uh, Roger Ver, uh, Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, uh, Epicenter Bitcoin, the Bitcoin core developers, everyone that are literally doing Bitcoin. It's a super cool thing happening right now. So what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is digital money. It's money like euros and dollars, but it's not owned by a government or a bank. Uh, you can send it from any point in the world to any other point instantaneously, securely, for free or very little fee. One example, the largest transaction ever recorded on the, on the, on the Bitcoin network it was $150 million. It was sent in one second for zero fees. And that alone shows you the, the potential of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is internet for the money, um, money for the internet, but that's just a small part of it. Yeah? That's like you're saying, uh, you know, in the early 90s, when people said, uh, uh, you know, is the at sign, is that internet? No, 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 Tracy, the at sign, that's email. Uh, so what is www? Yeah, same thing with Bitcoin now. Bitcoin is, is also digital money, but that's just one thing. What Bitcoin is, is it's a distributized, decentralized distributed system. Those, those are a lot of fancy words. This is a centralized system. Uh, this could be like a bank, Google, Facebook, a bank, a uh, healthcare institution. What do they do? They gather information. They hoard this information. Could be your money, could be health records, could be your searches, your emails, everything. So they collect information from the consumer. So we give them power. Information is power. So we trust them to keep this information safe. So they are our watchmen. <coughs> so yeah, so we're literally giving them superpower uh, authority because they're keeping all our records, right? So we have to trust them. So that's how things work today. Centralized system, right? The only problem is there's one center 
which means there's one center to attack, right? So um, if you go to Family Mart or, or eBay or Amazon or 7-Eleven or wherever you spend money, you, you, you pull your car credit card, you're giving all the information on the card to that supplier. Everywhere you, you swipe your card, you're giving information and you're giving away pull requests, which the, you authorize the, the take money from your, from your account. So even, you know, small shops. Bitcoin is decentralized, distributed network. It means there's no center to attack and everyone in the network can talk to each other, right? And Bitcoin solves the ancient, the old problem of decentralized trust. Before you had to have one center with one trust. The invention of Bitcoin is decentralizing trust. That's the invention of Bitcoin. So you don't need to rely on these people anymore. Yeah? Who watches the watchman? That's the question. You don't need them anymore. The network does. So that's the first dis decentralized dis distributed network of trust. And it's 100%. It proves trust 100%. Wait, how, how do you trust love Very good question, Ben. You, I'll answer that. Did you hear about Mt. Gox? It went, it, <laughs> it, there, was a, there was an exchange doing Bitcoin and someone stole $500 million worth of Bitcoin from the exchange and that's in today's value. It could be billions, trillions in a not a long time. And, and you ask Ben, how did they hack it? Well, the problem is people gave their passwords to Mt. Gox. So they operated as a normal bank. And so people went to Mt. Gox, hacked Mt. Gox, took the passwords, took the money. So Mt. Gox went bankrupt and it failed because it operated as a centralized system. That's why it failed. Well, he's, he's in Japan, right? And he's going to be in trial now. Yeah. 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 It was like a French guy. Yeah. Yeah. So they failed, but they failed because, uh, you know, okay, I don't have time, so I don't want to go through this. This is a rant on the banking. Uh, basically saying that, you know, fiat currency is fractional reserve banking, which means if you have, if you put $100 in your bank, the bank can take, if it's 10% uh, reserve, they can take 90 and borrow it out. And the guy who gets $90, he can write a check, and then the bank can borrow out, send out 89 again. And it continues. So $100 can become $1,000. It's a fraction. Yeah? And also, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve can print money. If the government, before, when, uh, government, if the government wanted to go to war, they needed money, right? So they have to raise money from the people. But today you have the Federal Reserve, which means the, the government makes uh, uh, bonds, and then the Fed prints money, and they just trade the money for the, for the government bonds, and now you have money. And by, so it's an infl inflation system. And by printing more money, you make everyone else's money a lower value. It's inflation. Uh, inf inf inflationary system. So we have a lot of debt in the world today. That's the current system. Bitcoin, it's asset based. So if you have 10 Bitcoin in the network, no one can take it from you. It's in the network, guaranteed, proven. It's like a safe deposit box. It's an asset. It's like gold. Right? It's not leveraged. The issuing of bit Bitcoin is predictable. Everyone knows how much is going to be printed every time all throughout history. Totally is going to be, be made 21 million Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is the deflationary system. And one dollar, you, you can break into 100, right? You can break into so cents. Bit, one Bitcoin, you can break it to 100 million. So, and there's going to be maximum 21 million Bitcoins. So 21 times 100 million is 21 quadrillion co coins. One, the smallest unit is called the Satoshi, named after the founder. <coughs> Bitcoin, this is what the Bitcoin network looks like. And this is interesting because most people have no clue. How big is the Bitcoin network? Bitcoin is the world's most powerful computing network. If you take the 500 fastest supercomputers, the Bitcoin network is 256 times more powerful. And that was in 2013. In the history of humanity, Bitcoin is the most powerful computer network ever made. You know, doing one thing. Ben is shaking his head. Dedicated to that. If Google took all servers, all the computer power of Google, turned it on to Bitcoin, they're going to be 1% of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is 100 times more powerful than Google. So I'll go very quick now. Uh, so as internet isn't just electronic mail, Bitcoin isn't just electronic money. The internet is, is a network 
that allows a lot of cool stuff to happen. It allows applications to build on top of that network. It's the same with Bitcoin. It's not electronic money. Money is one thing you can do on the Bitcoin network. It's a protocol. Um, so let's just run through this really quickly. What can we, okay, so we have this network now called Bitcoin. So what can we do? Let's look at some financial imp uh, applications. Money we covered, banking, you know, uh, a 10 year old in 10 years can run the SWIFT network on his mobile phone. Yeah? He can be a bank, he can be a brokerage house in 10 years. But by the time they are allowed to open up a bank account at 16, they'll have five years experience using Bitcoin. And then in fact, we're already seeing this. People, are, kids are using Bitcoin because they're not allowed to open up a bank account before 16. And by the time they get to Bitcoin, try to explain to them what a check is. Try to explain to them why you have to pay them five pounds to, to, so you can keep their account with you. Yeah? Try to explain what, what an overdraft fee is. While you're doing that, you might as well send them a fax machine and a landline because they're, they're just as likely to bother as they are to open up a bank account. Uh, payments, I'll, do, I'll do be like one minute now. Sorry, sorry. But, uh, today in the world, there's uh, 380 billion transactions being done. And every transaction, you have to pay a little fee to the credit card companies. With Bitcoin, it's all free or for very little, very little money. Uh, you can do micropayments. You, you can pay like, you can download, you can, you can pay for one listen. You can pay for one article. You can, send, you can send one cent from here to Africa and it costs nothing. Yeah? You can't do that with a normal payment network. This is too expensive. It's eaten up in fees. So the international money transfer market, every year, $500 billion are sent home to families. So like a Somalian guy in, working in the US, he's sending 500 billion every year. 74 billion is fees. So there he's paying visa and up to 30%. Up to the poorer the country, the higher the fee. Yeah? With Bitcoin, there's no fee, free. So you're refunneling $74 billion from the most, uh, uh, the, the biggest companies to the poorest people. And things like aid, $150 billion are, are sent to aid. And who are they sent to? You know, dictators, countries, the richest people in the poorest countries. And you hope some of that money is going to trickle down. Bitcoin, you send directly to the people. Done, for free. Lending, borrowing. I, I'll just jump this, but uh, it's, it's crazy things you can do with Bitcoin. Really crazy things. You can, you can track, for example, the, the services and goods from production to the end user, 100%. You can set up uh, a living will, a trust. If a person dies, he sets up a contract on the Bitcoin network and it will go through, no matter what anyone does. It will go through and it's 100%. So let me just skip it. Uh, so people have opinions about Bitcoin. <laughs> no, he's, he said, he said the, the the, was that the issuing power of money should be taken from the banks and give to the people. And that's what Bitcoin does. So I, I clearly included it there. So banks are, you know, ba so banks, are banks interested in Bitcoin? Well, they're starting to be. In the beginning, they were ignoring it, but now they're getting around, right? It can be a revolution. Yeah, probably can hurt the banks. Blockchain is the same as Bitcoin, basically. They're looking into virtual cur currencies. Uh, they have a project with 22 of the biggest banks working together with, with R3 CEV to, to experiment with Bitcoin. But they're also trying to discriminate against it. They're trying to block it. Anyway, you know, I'll stop it here. Um, because I'm really sorry that I went over time. I'm sorry, Ben. Uh, that was my mistake. Uh, so, bit Dude, that's a lot more. But, uh, so basically, Bitcoin is an expensive technology. Normal money is not. So let's see in a couple of years what's going to happen. Uh, on the left is my WeChat. Actually, whoever scans it now, uh, I'll make a group so everyone connects instantly to each other, if you want. Yeah. Uh, that was one of the best things. I went to this uh, seminar, and the guy just did that. Everyone scanned it. He made one group, so everyone are connected now instantly to, to each other, if you want. On the right is my block blockchain uh, Bitcoin address. It looks the same. So you can send money. 
there was a guy in the US during the NFL, you can actually start setting up now if you want. Uh, there was a guy uh, in an NFL match <laughs> and uh, he needed money for college. So he had like a sign, <laughs> uh, he just started showing the QR code saying, hey, uh, I need money for education. People are sitting home like, oh cool, they just took out their phone, swiped it, they scanned it and sent him Bitcoin. So every person said, you can send one RMB. He got $10,000. <laughs> Crazy, huh? So, so you can send one. Okay, so I make one last point when, when, when Ben is setting up. And again, I'm sorry for, for the time. Um, so right now you're doing Twitter, right? Let's say you support someone. I support someone in Venezuela, which I really like. What can I do today? Hey, I can give him like a Facebook you like. Or I can send him a tweet. You know, hey, you can retweet. It's really cool. You know, it shows support. Yeah. But with Bitcoin, you can actually send them money. Which means everyone in the world, if they like someone, they can send someone money, right? So that's you're putting power, uh, you're putting power behind it. It's going to change a lot. So you're also again taking then uh, the power away from the corporations and s uh, giving it to the people. When you use the restroom, you can talk about Bitcoin. Oh, seriously? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, oh yeah, it's cool. I mean, there's so many things with Bitcoin. It's just insane. Again, Andreas has a book, 300 pages, and that doesn't even explain Bitcoin. And I have like one minute to do it now. But yeah, there's some like a thousand other currencies. So you can just make money. You can make programmable money. Bitcoin is just one. And they're called uh, alternative coins, altcoins. You have do Doge. Sorry? Oh, the blockchain. Well, it's, yeah, well. If you look at all the articles, uh, actually banks, they're scared to say Bitcoin. Because Bitcoin, right, <laughs> the whole Bitcoin thing went through the same as the internet, right? The reactions to Bitcoin, right? First it was denial. Bitcoin isn't real money. Uh, it's just silly inter internet money. Yet you can buy goods and services for it. Yeah, It's real money. It's Sorry? Well, no, they're they're making regulation now. You know, it's really new. It took a long time before internet go was regulated. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, the, like the, ex I mean, the example that I gave. So, okay, let's say. It, I mean, you know, there's, you know, the let let before, um, you know, there, there's a separation of church and state, and there's a separation of in the U.S. of uh, government and money, Federal Reserve. It's, it's federal, right? It's public. No, it's not. <laughs> it's something, it's independent of, of, of the government. You know, it, operates in, it operates like a private corporation. And they print the money. And they loan it to the government. I mean, how crazy is that? Uh, you said corruption. You know, bef before, they separated money from the government because um, uh, government manipulates money. Now, money, ma money manip manipulates government in some places, right? Just look at the lobbyism, right? So instead of you have big corporations funneling money into politicians, people can now do it, you know? Instead of saying, hi, I really like you, there's a lot of people, you know, that have all this grassroots mo uh, um, support from people, but they c what they can do, they can have a sign, and they can say, we really like you, I follow him on Twitter. Well, now you can give him money. Now every person in China can send one RMB to a person in America. He has, he's, you know, he has, he has a billion dollars. A billion? Yes, I'm still on Bitcoin. <laughs> so I'm sorry, we we'll switch now. I'll shut up. But we have a Q&A. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, so you need this, right? Yeah, let's see if it works. Yeah, yeah.